Hey, hey, good morning. Welcome to Travels with Jordy. If this is your first visit, my name is Peter Olls and I live on that old wooden cruiser in Victoria, British Columbia, along with my pup, Jordy. Say hello, Jordy. Well, hey, wow, another present in the mail. Can't believe it. Uh, this arrived for me uh, just the other day and I uh, thought we'd open it together. Now, I know what's in this, uh, which is good because what it says in the box is underwear feels like wearing nothing at all, which was very amusing to the young lady in the marina office when she handed it to me. So uh, fortunately, as I said, I was able to explain to her that it's not actually underwear. Well, anyway, I'm not sure she believed me. What it is, is a long tail shirt. Um, one of uh, my subscribers, uh, the Doryman of Prescott, Wisconsin, um, noticed that uh, some people might have been teasing me a little bit about a little butt crack in an earlier scene, and I had tried not to uh, not to uh, let any of that through. But apparently, this company, Duluth Trading, makes three-inch longer plumber's butt fixed long tail T-shirt, and he sent me one. Let's open it up. Okay, so let's have a look. That's a lot of box for a little shirt. Wow, this isn't a little shirt. This is a substantial shirt. Holy moly, this is really quite nice. Wow, that is a nicely made shirt. And look at the length of it. Here, come on up here. All right, it's like it's long. It's seriously long. All right, well, um, this will permanently cure any um, possible butt cracking. Uh, thank you very much, Dorman of uh, Prescott, Wisconsin, and uh, I'll be wearing this in any butt crack risky episodes in the future. Okay there, so I've cut a bunch, and I've just dropped a bunch on the floor, of uh, plugs. Um, you might have seen some footage of that. Um, it's a slow process. <laughs> it's kind of painstaking, but they're really nice because they're tapered. So they really, and they have a slight chamfer on the end makes them really easy to insert and just set straight up. Um, so I'm very happy. I don't need as deep a uh, counterbore as I gave on that particular one. So uh, after I pick up all these bungs, I will carry on drilling. So I'm driving these with the drill as well rather than the impact driver uh, because it's really hard to control a really gentle amount of torque and this of course has the torque setting that makes it much easier and I'll come back along with a screwdriver and adjust these. getting windy. Okay, now I think I mentioned to you that these plugs are really nice. The plug cutters I use are from Lee Valley here in Canada, but there's probably tons of plug cutters that make a similar plug. And it's slightly tapered, ever so slightly tapered, but also has a chamfer on the inside edge, making it really easy to get it in and get it started. Um, so they're great. Uh, so <laughs> this is a little embarrassing. Before I use my plugs, I mark a line with the grain. And that's because my eyes are the pits. And trying to see the grain while I've got them all covered with goo and glue and align them and get them straight and then check and all that, it's just frustrating. So I take the few minutes, and it's I guess it's more than a few minutes really, to sit here in advance and uh, make a line parallel to the grain on each one. Making the total equity uh, investment in every single one of these bungs more than a little. They're probably worth about a buck a piece. Anyway, by the time you get them going. So uh, yeah, I'll do this for a while and uh, then we'll glue some in. 
So I don't know if you can hear me, it's getting pretty blustery. I'm gonna put some plugs in. Wow, we're bouncing around. So what I did is I took the most burnt plug. Remember I mentioned I was worried about the, the burnt plugs? Some of them, as you can see, they're quite dark. So I took a really, really dark one and I bunked it in here and uh, chiseled it off and sanded it. And I maybe can see a little, I, I don't think I can see a ring. Anyway, it doesn't bother me. I'm pretty sure that that's gonna look okay. I'm gonna carry on. Um, yeah. So glue. Uh, I put a lot of bugs in without glue. These are tapered after all, so they're a tight fit. I hope this wind isn't making it impossible for you to hear me. Um, but for exterior work, I'm going to glue them. And I'm going to use Type On 3, which is theoretically wood uh, waterproof glue. Um, for gosh sake, don't use epoxy. Uh, when you're working on boats or anything, really, think about the person that's going to have to fix it after you, and that could be the you in the future. And getting out bungs that have been epoxied in is, well, it becomes part of the wood, it guaranteed split. Whereas if you use glue, or some people use varnish, or nothing at all, you can do the drive the screw in technique. I'm sure I've showed you that before. A little heat, and that bung will just slide right out and not damage the parent wood at all. So um, I might have used nothing or possibly varnish here, but I'm really concerned that I don't get any water into here because I don't want to see little black streaks down from any of these nails, I, uh, screws. I really don't. So that's why I'm going to go with the glue and the type on. Um, so just time to get ready. Uh, I'll show you the technique I use for that. So just put a little glue on a card, just a little, because I can always add more. It's going to dry up as we work. And then I just take the plug and the bung, and I just give it a little wipe around and then off again. That one's got way too much on it. Trying not to get any glue on the face of it, because I really don't want to get any glue, gosh, I don't know if you can hear me, in the head of the screw. That's the greatest sin, because then you can't get that screw back out. So here I go. I'm going to start with my first bung right in there. There we go, and I'm going to do a whole row before I hit them, uh, so I don't have to keep picking up different tools. Uh, this boat is bouncing around, I'll tell you. There we go. Okay, let's bang those in. Nice little square tack. Not too hard. You can tell by the sound whether or not you're not going in square. And this one wasn't. There we go. Alright. It's really bouncing and not very pleasant outside. Um, done. Now, huh, the upside of it is these fronts to the thwarts I can do indoors. Yay! Okay, well, I'm not particularly proud of the way that went. It took way too long, but it is dead straight again and solid. Yeah, that's the punishment I get for having left it a year just tacked together. Anyway, now to get some plugs in. Start with a little... Okay, let's pound those home. Okay, this one's done. Sometimes you have to earn a real living. Day job. And here we go. Time to knock the plugs off. Um, it's always a little bit daunting because every once in a while you'll knock one completely out or worse yet, when you catch it with the chisel, which is the way I do it, um, you don't start high enough and the grain is on an angle that it actually goes below the surface of the finished wood. So what you really want to do is use the chamfer side, the bevel side of the chisel, and uh, hit it as far out as really is practical and knock that plug off. And if you want, if, it, if the grain slopes outward, in other words, the bottom of the plug is more proud afterwards you can you know you can hit it a couple more times but generally hit it once and then whatever's left sands off really easy all right let's get started I should probably mention that I actually bent this chisel slightly. You can see it's bent over this way so that I could get it almost flush or at least much closer to this surface, thereby giving me a greater uh, angle on the, uh, on the bevel of the chisel. 
anyway, I don't know if that's all that crucial, but it just, I wanted to make sure I had just enough, like that one there, oh, right on the edge. Now I'll sand what's left off. Um, I'm using 60 grit on here, it'll make quick work of the rest of this, and uh, by the time that's done, I'll be able to tell how many of these I have to fix, replace, or maybe a tiniest little bit of fill. Um, there's also some more sanding that has to happen to this planking because there's still a little bit of oil in here and unfortunately that fills the uh, sandpaper very quickly so it's quite wasteful of sandpaper but um, I got to get that back to perfect sapelle. Let's see. Now painfully sapelle is really hard to sand. It's either really hard or it's really sappy. I don't know what it is, but it's incredibly difficult to sand. Plus, I have incredibly cheap sandpaper, but I have plenty of it, so we only get a couple of planks per disc. Keep on it. Um, I'm doing a first wave with 60 grit, which will get the old oil and the graying out of it, and then I'll come back across with uh, 80 and 100 to get um, it, uh, it nice and smooth. Then I, pour in, I have to sand out all the grooves again after I decide how much of these grooves I'm going to re -caulk. It's certainly these two because they're empty, but um, I think I might have mentioned the rest of it is in remarkably good shape. I might have one other failure on the other side. Anyway, sanding, sanding. That's about all of that I'll subject you to, but if you do like watching people sand, there are some other channels on the internet that you might be very, very pleased with. Cheers! Tedious work sanding out the grooves. If you missed the first time I did this, I've made a block and I put a little chamfer on it so that when it sits in this bevel, this chamfer, the what do you want, a groove, it doesn't sand out all of the caulking inside, the sealant inside. Um, it leaves that in a little concave and it's been working great. And I just take sanding discs and as I, they get dull, I just rotate it around to a new spot and uh, I'm off to the races. Well, pretty much sanded just about the whole all of this bloody stuff is sanded and cleaned up I have two plugs to replace they're both here that one and that one I don't that one I don't know why I never drove the screw in and this plug fell out I have one plug with a bit of a notch in it that's probably more notch than I want to fill so I will pull that one as well um, not the end of the world okay so it's time to deal with these two joints and there are only two I've checked every single joint along here and only two of these sealant joints failed and it's amazing it's on the same plank maybe this plank was soaking I don't know what happened but so it's now dry as a bone it's been sitting here in the sun and I've hidden heat on it and it's been exposed it is not going to get any smaller I've sanded it all up cleaned it out I'm going to reapply sealant Oop, these two and um, uh, that'll basically be my time constraint that'll be the thing that holds me up waiting for that and uh, then I gotta get some oil on it because this incredible mid-January sunny break is going to end and we're gonna have rain again soon. So I wanna have this sealed up before that happens. Okay, let's get to it. And I gotta make sure I'm only just on the chamfer. And the all important bond breaking tape. I've never worked with this stuff before, but I imagine it's just very skinny tape. Let's see if my banjo nail can get that off of there. All right. I don't suppose this is a particularly high finesse. Okay. Pretty straightforward. And now for the sealant. Okay, so I'm sticking with the Sikaflex 291, which is what I have in the previous joints. Perhaps not the best sealant going, and I've had some good advice that the perfect product here would be a product from um, Teak Deck Systems. It's there. Uh, sealant that they use for teak deck systems. Fantastic stuff. I'm sure I've never used it. I'll certainly be using it when I do the teak decks, but for now I'll just have to get by with this because I had it. So let's get this in here. Just to make sure there isn't too much excess. Make sure it's also packed right into that joint. Piece of cake. This is the only real offending plug uh, that broke out and there's a chip in the bottom that's more than I like to fill, especially in such a visible area. So I'm going to remove this plug and replace it. Now um, anyone who's been watching along has seen my technique for removing bungs and it's really very simple but it's also incredibly effective. 
So what I do is I drill a hole. I'm actually just going to use the counter bore because it's already in my drill to drill a hole right to the center of this. There we go. And then start a screw in it. And what this screw is going to do is going to act like a jack to push the bung out again after I heat it up and, and soften the glue. So the next step is heating it up. Heat gun. And then simply wind it out because the tip of this screw will sit on the other screw that's inside and push it straight out. How about that? Bung on a screw. So it's time to get some oil on. I apologize for the helicopter. It's been hovering over there for two hours and I need to take advantage of the light. Um, so not much to say anyway. I'm basically going to put oil on a very, very thin coat. Let's get to it. Okay, nothing much to it. Just rub it on. And of course it looks brilliant immediately. After the oil's been on an hour or so, I give it a good rub down because I don't want any film on here. I only want the oil to be uh, absorbed into the wood uh, because I'm going to varnish over this with uh, Epiphanes varnish. So it's really just to seal the wood and to give it some depth. Absolutely love it. That's just perfect. Okay, well there we go. I'm really pleased with that. Um, other than uh, that bung, uh, these two joints which still have damp caulking in them which I'll have to tidy up and then add some oil. Those two bungs. Um, pretty much ready for maybe one more coat of oil which i'll do when i sort that stuff out and then varnish uh, so i have to start moving on to some carpentry which is the brow piece uh, which is a curve and it's got a rabbit in it and it's got some extra complicated little ends yeah all good fun holy moly another gorgeous day it's unbelievable just back from a walk along the shore Ooh, it's pretty nice back to work okay so gonna deal with this offending plug and my two other little friends over there Let's uh, get this looked after. The second coat is where the tongue oil really starts to shine. And I, I admit that metaphorically, but boy, you get a lovely, lovely sheen. Um, but of course, that uh, wouldn't last very long out in the sun, so we have to cover that with varnish. But that lovely sheen underneath several coats of uh, Varnish will add so much depth to this wood, it'll look fabulous. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Okay, so as many of you know, at the end of a long work day, I like to indulge in a beer. And uh, well, the work day today is actually office work down in my little hell hole. But all the same, um, it's often Sleeman's Honey Brown. Now this is a fantastic consumer mass produced beer. Uh, very drinkable, drinkable out of the bottle. And what I mean by that is you crack this and it tastes great. Now, I live in the Pacific Northwest. A lot of the fantastic shit ton of uh, craft beers that are available here have um, a nose, as you might say, a nice aroma. Sometimes it's citrus, sometimes it's the hoppiness. So really, they're not best drunk from a bottle, they're best drunk from a glass. And uh, so if I'm just working, sometimes it's easier just to go straight to a bottle. But really, um, I much prefer drinking beer from a glass. So I thought I'd share with you one a week maybe, let's do this. Is this gonna be like a regular segment? And I'll share with you one of my favorite Pacific Northwest craft beers. I'm gonna start this week with Blue Buck. Now, Blue Buck by Phillips Brewery, brewed about a mile from here, is not necessarily my favorite beer. In fact, I haven't had one since I first moved to Victoria and I didn't think of a lot of it then. But the reason I'm gonna start with it is because a subscriber out there, Brian Dick, you know who you are, gives me the most grief about the Sleemans and suggested that this would be a good something to try. So uh, let's crack open this Phillips Blue Buck, see what we think. Okay, so Blue Buck is considered an English pale ale and um, uh, if I remember correctly, it has quite a nice color, nice dark amber color. Uh, let's see what we think. Looks promising. Doesn't look like your average cheap lager. Let's pour a little ahead at the end there. Okay, well, definitely has a very nice color. I'd say it's a very light IPA, very drinkable summer drink. So there you go, Phillips beer lovers everywhere. Blue Buck, pretty much a standard in Victoria, BC. This is um, an ordinary beer. Cheers!